Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Logos Research Associates live stream broadcast. I'm Carrie McMillan, an ambassador with Logos Research Associates, and I'm pleased to be your host this evening. Logos Research Associates is a fellowship of scholars and scientists who use scholarship, logic, and the scientific method to show that the historical claims of the Bible are not only credible, but are superior to evolutionary theory to explain the origin of the world we see. We're so thankful you all have joined us for tonight's presentation, which is part of a series of broadcasts that Logos Research Associates, Associates is hosting. This series will provide incredible learning opportunities as we hear from top researchers as they convey cutting edge scientific evidence for the creation account. We're gonna open this evening with just a short prayer if you would please join me. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to hear from Dr. Sanford tonight. Thank you for those who've put together this broadcast and the work that they've done behind the scenes. And we pray for all of us who will be listening in on this presentation, that you will soften our hearts to hear what you have to say through Dr. Sanford and that uh, you will help us to see new information that will um, just help us see the reality of your scripture and of your holy word and help um, our faith to grow even stronger. We thank you for uh, the minds that you've given these researchers that are part of Logos, that they are using their gifts and talents to um, help others of the faith, Lord, and help their faith to grow. We thank you for your creation and how beautiful and wonderful it is. Um, pray these things in your name. Amen. So throughout tonight's presentation, we do encourage you to type in comments and questions on your live feed through YouTube or Facebook. And we'll take some time at the end of the presentation for our speaker to answer any audience questions that come in. I now have the honor of introducing tonight's speaker. As a Cornell University professor, Dr. John Sanford conducted genetic research for over 30 years. This research resulted in more than 100 scientific publications and several dozen patents. In addition to producing numerous new crop varieties, Dr. Sanford's research resulted in new genetic engineering technologies, such as the biolistic gene gun process. And Dr. Sanford also started two successful, successful biotechnology companies. Since the year 2000, Dr. Sanford has engaged in science-based Christian apologetics, defending the truth of scripture. He has published numerous scientific papers and books in the area of biblical genetics, including the book Genetic Entropy, and I have the distinct pleasure of working with Dr. Sanford and applying that defensive truth philosophy to some of the current issues that our world is facing through his nonprofit organization, Feed My Sheep Foundation. Mm -hmm. Without further ado, I <clears throat> hand it off to Dr. Sanford. Thank you, Carrie. So hello, everyone. Yes, I'm part of Logos Research Associates, and I'm very excited about our new series of online presentations. Now, these are largely focusing on creation apologetics, but we will also address some social issues. These presentations will be universally accessible and will be ongoing. What better way to launch this effort than to go back and examine the claims of Charles Darwin? <clears throat> Hence, my title is Darwin Was Wrong. <clears throat> okay, so um, if we could, uh, I guess we already have the slide up, first slide up, Darwin was wrong. Um, I just want to say that uh, I'm going to be painting with a broad brush uh, because there's so much uh, that we could talk about with someone such as Darwin. And so um, we're going to keep, keep uh we're not going to get overly technical because this is for a broad audience. So let me ask you a question. Was Darwin the greatest scientist who ever lived? There are a lot of people who would say yes to that. But actually, based upon my research and his books, I would say uh, he isn't a great scientist. In fact, for the most part, he is more of a philosopher than a scientist. Is Darwin brilliant? Again, that's not clear. He was very diligent and he was the right person at the right time. Um, 
but I think he was quite an ordinary man based upon uh, what I've read about him. And yet, uh, even though he seems like a pretty normal person, he was exalted as if he was royalty. In fact, when he died, um, he was um, the, the royal family of England uh, came to his funeral and he was buried in Westminster's Abbey, which is remarkable given that he was an atheist. And so um, he, there's something special that empowered Darwin. And indeed, we can safely say that he changed the world. He was quite clearly the greatest atheist maker in history. And if we think about uh, the multiple generations that have passed since his time, we can arguably say that he destroyed over a billion souls. So there was something very powerful about what he did and what he taught. So um, let's move on with the slides. Um, I'm, there are four books that if you really want to know about Darwin, I would recommend. The first one is obvious, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. <laughs> that's a long, long title, isn't it? And so um, that's, that's the famous book. It's been, usually people shorten it to Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And you'll notice that I put the line, a line under by means of natural selection, because now the nature of natural selection is being questioned. And so um, that's going to be a point of contention, I think. So um, the second book, the first book, by the way, um, very thick, very slow, very methodical. Um, I guess that was the during the that era, uh, people liked really fat books. And so, um, that is a very useful book to understand what he was um, teaching, but it, it is um, hard to finish that type of a book. Um, the second book is The Descent of Man, and that came quite a bit later in his life. And uh, he was um, very worried about how people might react when he uh, wrote the book that said that man evolved from apes. And so, of course, in a Victorian era, uh, when a lot of people in England were still Christians, this was um, very controversial. And so um, I would, don't recommend it because it was incredibly poorly written, very scattered, and a large, most of it is not actually about the descent of man, but is on other topics um, that are tangential. So um, you might not, necessarily need to read that book. The book, the autobiography of Charles Darwin is very interesting and actually short. And um, it really makes it very clear that he was definitely a hardcore atheist. And, um, and so it, it's very interesting reading because of he was a very interesting man. And then lastly, um, the fourth book is Darwin, The Life of a Tormented Evolutionist. So <clears throat> that probably comes, um, seems pretty strange, don't you think? Uh, and yet this book was, um, it was considered by Stephen Jay Gould, one of the top evolutionary scientists of the last century. Um, he said this about the book. He said, unquestionably the finest biography ever written about Darwin. It was on to say Desmond and Moore, who are the biographers, are brilliant. So, um, so it's really um, an interesting thing. Um, it does appear, as I've read that book, that uh, Darwin was not just unhappy, but often felt tormented. So that's something we might talk about later in the question and answer period. So those are the books that are especially significant in my mind. And so um, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview, and um, we're going to talk about the seven ways that Darwin was wrong. Okay, so number one, obviously he was wrong about God. Number two, 
I'm going to show that he was wrong generally about science. Number three, he was generally wrong about geology. Number four, he was generally wrong about the fossil record. Number five, he was wrong about the tree of life. Number six, he was wrong about the nature of life. And number seven, he was wrong about natural selection. So um, those are the main things that he studied and promoted. And in each case, we find that they are lacking. So when, I, when you see an empty slide like this, what it means is we're about to shift to a new uh, icon. So um, you may have noticed that um, on, the, on the first slide, uh, this, this presentation was made by myself and Chris Roop. And Chris did uh, all of the um, images of the icons that make this, uh, I think, easier for people to understand. So let's look at the first image, which is icon one, Darwin was wrong about God. Well, we just mentioned that he's wrong about God. In what way? Uh, number, number one, that's a really good graphic. I believe it's a striking icon of, um, by the way, Darwin himself has become a great icon of our civilization. But, um, but this is a really powerful image uh, that makes us remember that although Darwin grew up in a pretty Christian country uh, and he, as when he was younger, was open to Christ, he eventually turned, even though he was aware of the gospel, he turned away from Christ. And that's such a tragic mistake. So professing to be wise, he became a fool, uh, which is a reflection of Romans chapter one. And um, so Darwin joined the crowd. He wasn't really the creator of evolution, but rather he joined the Enlightenment culture. The Enlightenment culture was basically about uh, humanism and basically the exaltation of humans, especially elite humans. And um, it rejected anything that might be supernatural. So it was a very naturalistic um, culture at that time. Even though lots of people were going to church, they weren't necessarily um, believers. And so uh, not only were was there an exaltation of skeptical intellectuals like Darwin, but scripture itself was already under attack at that time. And evolution was already popular before Darwin was born. A lot of people don't realize that there were evolutionary theories including uh, theories of his father that were all over the place. The thing that, uh, so, and so he was one among many who were trying to figure out a way to understand the world we live in, in terms of natural selection. Okay, and so in fact, natural selection is the one thing um, that he's, that's most original, I think, from him. Uh, Evolution was already popular, and the church was already embracing the idea of an old earth. There was at that time young earth geologists and old earth geologists, and the um, old earth geologists were winning over just because of the culture. They were winning over, um, and so that was uh, something that was happening in the culture. And lastly, the church was already rejecting the very idea of the fall, and so um, Darwin was in a culture that was in transition and that was moving away from faith. And that makes me think a little bit of the culture we're in now. So um, like many atheists, Darwin blamed God for evil. And this, this is, I believe, most the, the evolutionists who, who do this are really looking for an excuse for um, for rejecting the Lord. Um, but here's what the, here's what Darwin said. He said, a being so powerful and so full of knowledge as a God, it revolts our understanding to suppose that his benevolence is not unbounded. 
For what advantage can there be in the sufferings of millions of the lower animals throughout almost endless time? So there's a couple of things in that statement that um, that are meaningful. Number one, he has he he assumes almost endless time, which isn't biblical. And number two, uh, he doesn't mention the fall. And so because he doesn't he believes that uh, there's been uh, suffering and death in animals throughout almost endless time, and he doesn't believe there was um, the fall, then basically he has to blame God for the th these these things when he should have really been blaming mankind and uh, Satan. And so that's that's what, what you'll often see that when you talk with atheists, and it's basically they're brushing aside fundamental aspects of our of our faith and our um, and the Bible. And uh, and then they use it as kind of a way to dismiss faith. Okay, so this that was very short, but that's a little bit about Darwin's faith. Um, icon number two is Darwin was wrong about science. So the question is, was Darwin a scientist or a philosopher? And so what we see here is a famous statue of, of called The Thinker, and Chris has uh, given The Thinker a slightly different head, so uh, on top of the, so the head is Darwin's head. So anyway, um, which one was he? And so the answer is Darwin was primarily a philosopher, not a scientist. So <clears throat> Darwin was utterly committed to philosophical naturalism, which many of his colleagues shared. And uh, that means that basically um, people who, have phys who believe in philosophical naturalism say there is nothing supernatural. So we have to understand everything in terms of the natural world we see around us. And so that's obviously um, not a scientific position, it is a philosophical position. Uh, number two is his only degree was in theology, which is really surprising. Um, he did have interest in science. And when he went to university, his father was paying for him to go to the best schools, uh, but he somehow didn't cut it. And so uh, when he left the university, his father urged him to go into a, a theology uh, training and uh, not because either one, neither he nor his father were religious, but they knew that if you get were, got that type of training, you have a very easy life and that you would be considered a very reputable person. And so um, his, his, his only degree was in theology and he was generally not an experimentalist. Now, scientists do experiments. That's kind of how it distinguishes us as scientists. But uh, what we see with Charles is that he was mostly an armchair scientist. So he had an amazing experience traveling around the world on the ship called the Beagle. And I, I would have loved to have gone with him if they had a place for me. Um, it was a fantastic adventure. and. Um, but when he came back, he got married and he pretty much um, was an armchair scientist. He apparently was wealthy. And so um, he pretty much spent the rest of his life in his living room thinking thoughts. And I can relate to that because I spent a lot of time thinking too. But thinking thoughts is not science. And lastly, um, or further, um, he relied heavily on extrapolation. Now extrapolation is never good science ever. And the more you extrapolate, the more unrealistic extrapolation is, but he would often say things in his writings, I can see no limit for this or that. And you see, that's not science, that's just speculation. Similarly, he relied heavily on just so stories of his own making. And so he would start a paragraph with, I can imagine. And again, it's fun to imagine. I love to use my imagination, but that doesn't make me a science scientist. So uh, lastly, his, his ideas lacked scientific rigor. 
So he had some hypotheses, but they were untested. He never followed through on the testing of hypotheses. And so <clears throat> uh, primarily we can see that Darwin was a very interesting man, a very, in, very interested in the world around him, but he was primarily a philosopher much more than being a scientist. So that's, this is just, so basically uh, Darwin was wrong about science. Okay, now we're gonna jump to the next icon, which is the third icon. Darwin was wrong about geology. So <clears throat> Darwin had two basic books with him when he traveled around the world. One was a Bible and one was uh, three volumes of Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, which is, was a brand new, hot new book, uh, which, which was uh, secular and argues for that everything that happens in geology is slow and gradual. And so he took both of these books and um, pretty soon uh, the, the Bible was put away and he just devoured Lyell's books. And so he had a choice and he chose Lyell. Now, one of the places that they, uh, one of the really beautiful and extraordinary places uh, where the Beagle traveled was to Argentina. And they went up the river uh, of the Santa Cruz River uh, to just explore where it led. And, uh, and so as Darwin watched the water flow through the bottom of the valley, he started to think in terms of Lyell. Lyell believed everything that happens slowly, 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 and takes practically forever. And so Darwin's view of gradualism became this. Here's the quote. The river, through, though it has so little power in transporting even inconsiderable fragments, yet in the lapse of ages might produce by its gradual erosion an effect of which is difficult to judge the amount. Okay, so that's kind of a wordy way of saying basically that uh, if you, is, is that the valley was created by individual sand grains flowing uh, slowly and gradually down the river and picking up sediment and then taking it and uh, putting that sediment into the ocean. So that's that was his, um, his view. And so it's kind of interesting to see if he was right about that because he wrote about it and he was one of his major uh, high experience, high um, encounters with, with uh, the new world and with geology. So um, this is a, um, an aerial view of, of the river and the river canyon or the river valley. And you can see that it goes way, way back to the west where there are snow covered mountains. And so the interesting thing, if you fly all the way to the, where the mountains are under snow, what you find is that there is a remnant of a glacial lake that was there, and there's still glaciers there, and there's uh, and part of that lake is um, is still visible, and so here's another aerial view of the area that was where the lake had formed, very large lake, and you'll see toward the middle of the picture some formations that represent water movement very large amounts of water moving very fast. You can see the same type of ripples, let's say in a little stream. But here we see very large structures that would rep that are um, typically seen when there is a, a glacial lake which bursts and then all, all the water in that lake suddenly in just a matter of weeks uh, drains violently and catastrophically and rapidly and creates large rivers and erosion. So that's, um, Steve Austin is the one who made me aware of this. Um, I think maybe Steve gave me these slides. Thanks, Steve. Um, and so basically um, the very river that, um, that, that Darwin was so fond of thinking it, it moved just one 
grain of sand at a time. In fact, uh, looks to be a catastrophic event that carved out most of that valley. So it's just interesting to see uh, the, the geology and how, how Darwin was trying to figure it out because of Lyell wasn't figuring out accurately what had happened. So, um, so here's a, a comparison. Um, Charles Lyell's principles of geology is now totally obsolete. And now it's, um, he was, he said, uh, he was a strict uniformitarian. He said, everything happens slowly over deep time. But now geologists know that a huge amount of geology happens fast and violently and makes things happen in a short period of time. So Lyell's um, ideology is now toast, uh, but the Bible, which is an everlasting source of wisdom, uh, is remains and will remain. So uniformitarian geology is dead but the word of God is alive. Okay. Changing to a new icon. Number four, Darwin was wrong about the fossil record. So this is a fossil of a coelacanth. And the coelacanth, it was, um, you know, a, supposedly it lived in, a, in something like 400 million years ago. The coelacanth was... Um, swimming around, and then um, 66 million years ago, uh, all the coelacanths went extinct, or so it was thought. And so, um, so the coelacanth is considered extremely ancient, extinct for a very long time. And by the way, they felt that the coelacanth by its anatomy would have been in shallow water and that it would have even maybe been able to climb up onto land. And so um, they had a lot of um, interesting ideas based upon this fossil, but then something changed. So suddenly people started finding coelacanths that are alive and thriving. And they don't uh, live in shallow water, they live in deep water. And they don't climb up onto land they are strictly uh, underwater fish. And so it's so interesting how these things change. And so in Darwin's day, he thought coelacanths were extinct, but now suddenly, in spite of the supposed 66 million years gap, uh, coelacanths are back. So the fossil record. Um, Darwin fully recognized the fossil record of his day falsified his own theory. Now he talks, I'm going to go through these because they're kind of long quotes, but basically he's saying to the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian, I can give no satisfactory answer. Okay, so he's stumped about the nature of the fossils and where they have been deposited. And he goes on to say that there's stasis, which means things stay the same. Fossils, fossil uh, organisms are preserved in a, in a, continuously. So he says, the most eminent paleontologists and all the greatest geologists have unanimously, often vehemently maintained immutability of species. So Darwin was intimidated by his colleagues, but he really, really wanted to follow through with the, his, his goal of you know, deep time. And so um, here's the next quote from Darwin. He says, why then is not every geological stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chains. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against my theory or the theory. Okay, so he has a problem, a huge problem with the fossils. And so his solution is, he says, the explanation lies, I believe, in the extreme imperfection 
of the geological record. So that was a pretty good kind of excuse for why the fossil record wasn't working for him is they just had to look harder. So, um, but it turns out that Darwin was wrong when he predicted that the fossil record when complete would support his theory. So about 150 years later, what is the total fossil count? Well, billions, too many to count fossils. And there are roughly 250 million specific fossils that have been cataloged by type. And so um, we now know for sure that we can see the big picture of the fossil record. And so here is what uh, Stephen, Jew, Stephen J. Gould says about this. Again, he's this very famous paleontologist from the last century. Um, and um, he focused on the nature of fossils in great depth. And so this is what he says. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persist as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that are adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips of the nodes of the branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, and is not the evidence of fossils. Okay, so he's saying, um, we don't see the transitional forms and um, it's, the, and it's basically, they can't figure it out. So Eldridge and Tattersall were colleagues of Gould and they came to the same conclusion. They said, uh, 120 years of paleontological research later, it has become abundantly clear that the fossil record will not confirm this part of Darwin's predictions. So basically, Darwin was completely wrong about the fossil record. Okay, let's move on to the next icon. Darwin was wrong about the tree of life. Okay, now I've been blabbering along here for quite a while, and you're probably tired of my voice by now. If I had a joke, I would tell it to you, but I, I wanna just give you a breather before we finish this up. We're getting, we're almost done. So Darwin was wrong about the tree of life. Darwin is convinced that all living things derive from the same bacteria, the same single cell, and from that single cell gave rise to um, fungus and plants and animals and every whales. And so he's determined to present that, that idea. And so he uses the tree of life as a way to do that. The tree of life is a mental construct. So here's a tree of life. Um, and you can see actual fossil evidence, which is on the left, and Darwin's speculations on the right. The actual evidence on the left, we have time on the, um, on the left of each graph and morphology at the bottom of each graph. So we see uh, the Precambrian is deep, deep in the geological column. Cenozoic is toward the top. So um, what we see is uh, with the actual fossil evidence is we see lots of organisms that just stay the same over deep time. And so they're not evolving at all. They're just static or they change only slightly. The other thing we see is that there are many um, of those lines that don't come all the way down to the Precambrian. And so those lines are organisms that um, don't have a history. They don't have, they don't connect to anything else. And so um, they, we can't say what they are. Uh, we see toward the bottom on the right, we see an extinct something that went extinct a long time ago. So basically the actual fossil record does not show a tree. It shows a pattern of, um, of different times, time zones within the geological column, but it does not actually suggest that there is a tree of life. Darwin's speculations were basically based upon things that are alive today. At the very top of his tree, you have things that we can see today. We can see 
trees and squirrels and all these things that are alive. And we can guess how they might connect lower down and imagine that they all come to a single point, a single microorganism. But that's just speculation. It's not science. The only science is what we actually see in the present. And there's no clear evidence for a trunk or a tree with a trunk. So that's um, Darwin's tr tree of life has failed him. So phylogeny is the way that, um, it's a funny word, uh, just means that things have not, their natural groupings of life. And uh, they come, there's, and so you can distinguish these groupings by similarities and differences. So phylogeny tries to infer evolutionary trees, imaginary trees, based upon modern day similarities and differences that are only at the tips of the supposed tree. So this at the bottom, you see it says, similarities, differences do not reveal history. And that's right. So phylogeny is not reliable. It's largely, and basically the phylogenetic charts that, pe that scientists make all generally disagree. So it's not a very useful science, but it's something, the tree of life was very important to Darwin. So here's just an example of how phylogenies can occur. If you have lots of different objects and you can easily sort them and you can uh, base and you can make, um, phylogenies don't mean time, they mean diversity. Let me put it that way. That's the simplest way I can express it. Okay, now, Tree of Life, you know, in, in Darwin's day looked like this. These were just cartoons and just guesses of how things might have been. Uh, just fanciful cartoons. That's all they were drawing and saying, you see, it's Tree of Life, but it doesn't work that way. Um, now, as they became, when they gave up on the cartoons, they used the more systematic, stylized diagrams. But again, they're just basically, it's, you know, things at the top are what we see today, and the lines below are supposed inner, inner uh, similar um, or actually different bases of the tree. So <clears throat> these hypothetical cladograms, they're called, they're really not useful. A lot of scientists have spent their whole life trying to make these diagrams, but it's all conjecture except at the tips. And so um, bad way to use your career, I would say. So um, here's the interesting thing now is that now um, in my generation, uh, what we see is that Darwin was wrong. It's not coming from the creationists, it's coming from the, the, the evolutionists. So the new scientist is a journal and uh, they talk about um, how the Darwin was wrong about the tree of life. And so they would say, it's really more like a um, bush. You can't really tell what's connected to what. And so basically that completely overthrows the idea of a tree of life because it's, it's randomized. It doesn't really look like a tree at all. It's just a complex matrix. And so this is um, another uh, high-level evolutionary scientist, and he's published the, work, the article Uprooting the Tree of Life and published in Scientific American, very prestigious. And he says, this is what the tree of life looks like. It's just a hopeless mess. And you can't really sort out what's what or who's, to, who's related to who. And so the whole idea of the tree of life and phylogeny is now in a um, quandary because they've done everything they could and they just don't really have a, a significant or useful map that would map how these things developed. So just to finish this up um, with the tree of life, uh, here we see um, Darwin's handwriting. He says, I think, and you can see that he's got a little cartoon of a tree or with branches. And um, now the, the diagrams are much more sophisticated, but it's still the same basic thing. It's still just a cartoon and it's still just, I think. 
So the whole tree of life is uh, extremely questionable. Okay, next, um, this is, uh, we're getting almost done. Darwin was wrong about the nature of life. Now this was his biggest blunder, This and it's, and it's not his fault. In his era, no one had a clue what the nature of life is. Best they could do is use a very primitive microscope and see that there are little blobs, but they can't really understand what a cell is or DNA or anything else. And so this is not Darwin's fault. This is just the fact that in his time, there was almost no understanding of life forces. So here's an example of some of his um, uh, dreaming. Uh, Darwin believed life was simple, which is the biggest mistake that a biologist could ever make. We now know that life is unbelievably complex. But then he has a little story that he tells. And so he says, but if, and oh, what a big if, we could conceive, that is, imagine, that some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts and light and heat and electricity. In other words, what he's saying is he could imagine that a, a warm little pond, if you start throwing everything into it, like ammonia and salts and light and heat and electricity, somehow that's going to poof, create something new, a new form of life. And he goes on to say, and there might be a protein compound. He didn't even know what a protein was that a protein compound was chemically formed readily to undergo still more complex changes. It's so um, kind of pathetic, uh, his attempt to explain the origin of life. It's um, people have spent careers trying to create life and no one's even come close. People who say they have are simply um, not understanding what they're doing. Um, so this is um, this is so strange that he has these hopes that this would explain the origin of life. Just throw in some stuff and maybe life will come out of it is basically what he's saying. So Darwin lived before the biological revolution. So let me just take and see how we're doing here. Um, okay, we're, we're in pretty good shape in terms of our timing. Darwin lived before the biological revolution. And so it wasn't his fault, but he was utterly and completely ignorant of the universe of biological complexity. So, um, you know, he didn't know about cell biology. You could spend a lifetime just doing cell biology. You could do a lifetime of just doing biochemistry or a lifetime of doing molecular biology or a lifetime of Mendelian genetics or a lifetime of mutations. You could do a lifetime of DNA genetic code stuff, biological information, population genetics, neurobiology, and epigenetics. We'll talk about that later. But basically, uh, all of those fields, you could spend all your life in one of those fields and still only be scratching the surface. Our, our, no, our knowledge of life is only a tiny piece of what life is, but we already have a universe of life, even in every cell. So um, the bottom line is there's no way you can get spontaneous generation because all the different components of life have to come together at once and integrated working together before you can have a living cell. And it can't happen by any type of step-by-step -step process. Okay, so life is a universe of complexity. And a single cell is at least as complex as let's say New York City. And so within a single cell, there are information systems comparable to the internet. Within a single cell, there's energy systems like a city's energy grid. And in a single cell, there are mechanical designs and devices that allow rapid duplication of all the parts. And that's just a beginning of what's going on in a single cell. It's something we'll never really 
understand. But the more we research, the more we find, there's more to find. And the, it's exciting. It's so exciting what's happening in biology today. So um, there is a key book. Uh, I don't have time to really describe it much. But uh, I organized a symposium at Cornell University um, to talk uh, to um, basically get 29 scientists together to produce 24 scientific papers uh, in the symposium. And then it was published in um, a major volume of uh, World Scientific. And so um, that book is now 10 years out of date. But even then, it was so exciting to see everything that's happening in the biological realm. So um, 29 authors, 24 papers, almost 600 pages. Uh, you probably don't want to read the whole thing. So um, I'm going to skip over this, although it's, yeah, I have to keep moving. So um, these two books are books that, uh, um, one is the biological information book with me being the senior editor of that book. Uh, that's what I just described as basically unreadable, except for deeply um, deeply entrenched scientists who are putting it together. Um, the other image we show here is, um, it's actually the cover of my first copy of Genetic Entropy. And it shows a spaceship and a bunch of books in libraries. And I just wanted to, explain why that cover is relevant is basically you need volumes and volumes and volumes of libraries of books or information before you can even start to build a spaceship. And that spaceship won't go anywhere unless humans are building it and maintaining it. And if either the library or the spaceship don't have, uh, if they lack humans, they will degenerate systematically and certainly. And so that just kind of tries to help you see a little bit, just a tiny bit of the complexity of life and how biological information is crucial for every cell in the body. Okay, now we're uh, getting close. One more slide on the nature of life, the peacock's testimony. <laughs> this is so interesting. Um, so Charles Darwin was writing to his friend and um, he said, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me sick. This kind of relates to his tormented condition is when he sees something that's so beautiful and so impractical, just something God made just for the fun of it, it makes him upset because it destroys all his theories. And so, uh, this, um, of course, peacock feathers are incredibly beautiful. And, um, oops, so those feathers, if They've done studies. If you take the feathers off the peacock, uh, it remains fertile. In other words, this is not about mating. It's about beauty. It's about just downright a stunning beauty created by God. And so um, what makes Darwin sick to his stomach it delights us in the work of God. So one more icon, hang in there just a little longer for me, please. Uh, Darwin was wrong about natural selection. We're gonna go fast here. Uh, Darwin's, uh, here we have a frog and a little golden crown and a little uh, magic wand. And of course that's not how it works, but it's kind of like how people imagine it works. So, um, Darwin's all-powerful selection, let's just read about it. Slow through the process of selection, th slow through the, though the process of selection may be, if feeble man can do so much by his powers of artificial selection, I can see no limit to the amount of change which may be affected in the long course of time 
by nature's power of selection. So that's his, uh, that's what make that's his, the, the, what he's famous for is the idea of natural selection. So uh, it turns out that natural selection is a very misleading term. There are a lot of evolutionists and creationists who feel that it is inappropriate term. And I propose that we might use three terms that might clarify. First is coincidental, coincidental random changes happen, but they're almost always harmful. And there are lots of directed and designed changes that can happen in an organism, which are almost, almost always productive because those changes are, um, they happen as needed. And so there's like intelligence in those types of change. And then lastly, minor adaptive changes, what I call fine tuning, basically involves causing changes that stabilize the kind. And so um, we're gonna, for example, here we have two different finches. One has a big beak, one has a small beak. Uh, it's clear that depending upon the weather, uh, beaks get bigger or smaller. And so that um, does not look to be by random change. It looks like there's designed process that helps the beach, the, the, the beat the uh, finches to um, change so that they can stay the same. Let me say that again. These changes that are design changes are things that are inherently beneficial, but aren't due to mutation. Okay, so when we talk about adaptation, uh, one finch versus another, it requires minimal new genetic information and, and minimal uh, possible design change. I don't think anyone knows exactly what makes the finch beak, beak change bigger and smaller, but it's, um, but it's clear that that type of adaptation happens all the time. And so we say yes to that type of adaptation. But at the bottom, you see it. Darwin believed natural selection could change a bear into a whale. And Darwin above says, there's no limit to change, question mark. Well, the bear can never become a whale because they have to have a completely different genome and because um, there's no transitional form that would make turn a whale, a bear into a whale. So that's, um, so we say no to the idea of no limits to change. There are very strong limits to change. And so um, this is our last slide. And I really appreciate your patience. I'm running a little bit over. Um, Darwin was wrong. So what? He won fame, but at what cost? He experienced personal torment during most of his life. His soul was lost. His family was lost. And because of him, countless, sail, countless souls followed him and were lost. Perhaps over a billion souls were motivated by evolutionary theory to reject God and to lose their souls. So this is a very, very sad ending, and but it's very real. And we, we, um, we have work to do, and that is we need to bring, strengthen people's faith, and we need to do it, especially in our families and with our kids. Okay, thank you so much for listening. I think we're ready for questions and answers. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sanford. That was an excellent talk. And uh, I specifically loved the part about the fossil record. And I, I know I learned a lot in that and really appreciate the information that you shared. Um, we do have some more questions coming in, but the first one that I wanted to ask you was about the book that you mentioned. Um, so can you share with people how to access that book? There was some talk about you know where they might be able to get a copy. 
Oh, the, the okay. I'm so biological glad information. That one. Yes. So if they go to Feed My Sheep Foundation, uh, they can buy the book there. Um, although most of our work has moved from creation evolution uh, to on that website to um, trying to defend the children. But um, I'm excited. Uh, if if they can't get it through our website, they can go to Amazon. And Amazon will, uh, if you just write biological information, new perspectives, uh, you will quickly be able to pick it up. And let me just offer those people who, I'm so glad that they're interested in that book, but it's really quite overwhelming. But we've written a uh, small uh, booklet which summarizes the 600 page book. And uh, so they might, uh, if they're overwhelmed by the book, they can use the booklet and that's available through Feed My Sheep Foundation. Uh, and it's, it can be available at, at, at low cost and and something you could read in an afternoon. Yeah, so, and um, the link through Feed My Sheep Foundation goes to a new website, which is biological information, newperspectives.org. And on that website, which did come across the screen there, thank you so much to our moderator, Zach, for that. Um, you can order the full book or you can download that free synopsis or order printed copies of that synopsis if preferred, like Dr. Sanford was mentioning. So that's excellent. Thank you. Um, so another question that came in, uh, which I thought was really excellent and, and perfectly pointed to your expertise, Dr. Sanford, was do you think that if Darwin had known about DNA, he would have thrown out his theory? Or would he have tried to find a new way to explain it naturally because ultimately getting rid of God may have been his goal? Yes, I think that um, if people weren't, if, if, if atheists were open-minded and they looked at what we're learning about biology, they would all stop being atheists. But there is a pride issue. And that's, it's very hard for people to give up something that they've held to for most of their life. And, um, but yes, the, the, the evidence now is overwhelming. Uh, life is designed and it ha doesn't happen by chance or by random mutation. It's overwhelmingly true. And um, it's, it's like a gift from God that he's disclosing, it's uncovering all this design that is, um, we're just starting to discover. So it's it's we can thank God for what he's doing in the biological area because um, he's giving us so much cause to believe and to encourage others to believe. Yeah. And I think um, that's absolutely true. It hit right through the DNA and you've you've talked a lot about that in other talks as well. Um, someone had responded to that comment with a follow-up question. Do you think that biologists today throw out evolutionary theory uh, because of knowing about DNA, or are they still holding on to that? I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on people now uh, to be politically correct. I think a lot of people would be, uh, if they weren't... Um, so committed to the establishment, the university establishment, um, they would be very open to uh, start with um, design, intelligent design. And then uh, as they go deeper, they will see that if, if you start to see intelligent design, it has to be, it's really clear that the design has to come from a designer. And so it leads people to God. And so that's a, and as a as our as our world gets crazier, um, I hope and pray that more and more people will see, wow, I need God. This is this is crazy. I need to find a place where um, where people are still sane. And so I I believe there will be um, many people now as as things get worse. I think we'll see more and more people turning to the Lord. Mm -hmm. 
So there was a lot of conversation, well, some conversation in the comments about racism and um, how maybe some of what Darwin mentioned in his theories and in his books seemed quite racist. And I know you had mentioned uh, some connections to eugenics. So I was just hoping that you could com comment on that and maybe the combination of the two. Okay. So, so Darwin was uh, a racist, but he was, um, but he wasn't hostile to uh, to people who are of different um, origin, and so um, I'd say that um, he he definitely was racist. You can read it in the book uh, *The Descent of Man*. Um, it's quite explicit, um, but um, I think he had some compassion for people different from himself, although he was. Uh, the, the bigger issue was eugenics. And so um, the nature of racism is that it often elicits eugenics. And one race wants to say that one race is better than another. And they want to actually, you know, eliminate people who are um, less fit, or they might... Um, just not allow those people to reproduce. But um, most of the scientific community <clears throat> between 1900 and World War II were eugenicists. And they were openly eugenicists, usually. After World War II and with the eugenics and the, the cruelty of, of Darwin, of Hitler, excuse me, um, people started to back off on that. But um, if we go all the way back to Darwin, what we find out is that Darwin's cousin, Gelton, uh, was a big, big um, fan of eugenics. He defined the term eugenics. And uh, he had, and so Darwin liked the idea of eugenics a lot because it made him feel superior to everyone else, he and his family. And uh, so not only did Galton uh, be prom was promoting eugenics, but two of Darwin's sons became very involved in the eugenics movement of that time. And they both took turns being president of the Eugenics Society of England. So. Um, so yeah, so Darwin was heavily involved in eugenics, he and his family. So that's a dark side of Darwin, another dark side of Darwin. Well, I appreciate you addressing that uh, complex uh, portion of, of this. Um, we've got a lot of more great questions coming in, but we are past our time. Dr. Sanford, do you want to take one or more, one or two more, or should we close out? Um, I'm, I'm ready for a little more. Um, I, I don't want to, uh, at some point we can, we might be able to respond to questions from a distance if people leave uh, an email, but, yes. um, but I, I'm willing to hear, take a few more questions if you're interested. Okay, yeah, there's just so many good ones. Um, it's hard It's hard to select all of them, so hopefully we can get a chance to go back and address some of these at a later time. Um, so let's see here. Um, somebody wanted to know about not, not, they were trying not to ask in any hostile manner, but they were curious what you think of um, a new CET model from Dr. Jalusa. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Uh, the question was, are all beneficial changes designed or does the environment play a role in these changes? Right. So um, I think that that's a topic for discussion. And so I think that there are, um, at the my last slide or second to last slide talked about that. And um, there are a lot of changes that happen in organisms uh, that happen quite quickly. And uh, normally if you have mutations hap happening to cause those changes, it doesn't really work because mutations, um, you know, the, the, 
it begins with a single mutation happening in a single bird. And then, uh, then that gene has to transfer to all the other birds. And uh, if it's more than just one mutation, it, it uh, things like the rapid changes with uh, Galap the, the finches of the Galapagos, um, they, it seems to be happening faster than mutation selection would uh, explain. Uh, so I, I think that that's mostly due to what's called epigenetics. So it's not involving changes of the genome, but changes of other regulatory patterns in, this, in the body of, of the organism. So I think this would be an interesting topic for discussion. Certainly there are mutations. Certainly sometimes mutations have um, very rarely have an effect that might be beneficial, although it's usually beneficial in an artificial sense. But these are really great discussions. Um, and rather than argue about it, we should um, think about it and have um, good discussions. Yeah, and I think uh, you brought up a perfect transition to another question, which I think will be our last tonight before we close out, and then we can get to some others maybe um, by replying to comments. But uh, this this comment said, epigenetics is showing us that the genome is much more complex than just the information that's stored, and that this discovery rocks the evolutionary theory. Shouldn't evolutionists be panicking? Are they? And if not, why not? Okay, they're not panicking because they are, uh, they've are they been brainwashed. They have committed their life and their prestige and their personal value and their identity to that ideology. And so it, it takes something like a miracle. I was, I was saved at 39 and it was, you know, God intervened in my life in a major way. And so um, that's the type of change. You're not gonna get people casually saying, yeah, I guess I'm gonna give up on evolution, become a creationist. That's people who become creationists, they become creationists because they, because uh, God has um, touched them in a meaningful way and their life has been changed. Well, I do appreciate everything that you shared tonight, Dr. Sanford and um, your vulnerability with us now. and the information that you've researched over uh, decades, really, to contribute to this conversation and just really appreciate it. Um, we did have some comments just mentioning uh, that your books have uh, made a really big difference. So somebody was mentioning that the genetic entropy has es essentially taken down any Darwinism um, theory. And then others mentioning that contested bones and genetic entropy are, are certainly must read books. So, um, mm. you know, we do appreciate your work on, on those books as well. All so right. That's so great. I'm, I'm whoever is out there, God bless you. Um, so grateful that, uh, that you not only, uh, listen, but, uh, engaged. So that's wonderful. Carrie, thanks so much. And, um, I'm just uh, grateful. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Sanford. So as a reminder to everybody, uh, we just want you to make sure to check out the Logos Research Associates website. And when you're on there, you can learn about the various research efforts of all of our associates and ambassadors and find information about their publications. The amount of information from these scientists is just incredible. Uh, while you're on the website, we do encourage you to subscribe to the Logos email list so you can receive notifications about other upcoming presentations and other relevant creation-related news. Uh, something new to the website that we wanted to mention is that uh, there's an opportunity to learn more about original research projects and even donate to specific projects, which is a unique opportunity within the field of creation science to really be able to become more involved with specific research. Um, we do want to let you know also that a recording of this video will be made available on the website so you can share it with others who may not have been able to join us live tonight. It should also be available immediately on the YouTube and Facebook channels. Our next presentation will be in just a few weeks on Wednesday, April 12th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Our presenter will be Dr. Brian Thomas, who's a research scientist with the Institute for Creation Research. Dr. Thomas has a master's in biotechnology and a PhD in paleobiochemistry. He's taught in Christian schools and Dallas area universities. 
and he authored Dinosaurs and the Bible, as well as a number of other works. The title of his talk is Fossil Proteins from Four Continents. And the questions are, were red blood cells really discovered inside dinosaur bones? Are fossilized structures that look just like blood vessels, cells, and skin actually from the original creatures? Yes, just to give you an idea of what's coming up. Original organic materials show why rocks and fossils look thousands, not millions, of years old. So I certainly recommend that you register for this presentation and, and join us in just a few weeks. So now I'm going to just close this out in a short prayer, if you would please join me. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I do thank you so much for Dr. Sanford. Just thank you for the work that he's done over these past years and the influence that it's had on countless people, including my own, my own life, Lord. And just thank you so much for his mind and the uh, dedication that he's had to you and um, to studying creation and studying um, science. And we thank you for these broadcasts and the ability to communicate this information um, with anybody who's able to access the internet. God, it's such an amazing thing. And we just thank you for it. And all of those who were able to put this together, we pray for our upcoming talks as well, that you will be uh, helping our next speakers to prepare these talks and uh, share the information in a way that is receivable. Um, pray that you will help us to take the information we learned about Darwin tonight and challenge what we're taught in school and challenge uh, what others just accept as truth um, with this new information. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you in the next broadcast.